So just quickly before we get into the regular episode, I just wanted to apologize for some of the technical errors we had during this particular program. Yours truly apparently did not realize for the first two segments of this episode that I was recording on my computer mic instead of my regular podcasting mic. So my sound quality might not be as good. We also had some guests that were on their laptop mics as well. So I tried to clean it up as best as I can, but just please understand that uh, not everything went according to my plan, but I still hope you enjoy the episode. Thank you. This podcast may contain explicit language. Welcome to the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast, the show that uses a unique grading style to redefine what the greatest movies are. I'm Tom Duncan. It's dogs and cats living together, and I'm Dana Duncan. We also welcome our returning celebrity guests. First up, you know him from episodes like Saving Private Ryan and Red River, my brother-in-law, Keith Techmeyer. Hi. Thanks for having me back. I'm excited. This this is my favorite movie of all time. So I've been uh, been looking forward to this. I know. I know it's your favorite movie of all time. It's right up there with Star Wars for you. And we have specifically recruited you because we knew it was your favorite movie. And as an outreach program within the family, so as not to burn any bridges. We wouldn't want any awkward Thanksgivings or family holidays, even more than they usually are. They're still going to be awkward. Well, yeah, my sisters are involved. Anyway, next, you know this returning guest from his work with us on Office Space. It is associate at Duncan Disability Law, Adam Vanderwerf. Thanks for having me, Tom and Dana. This is probably my second favorite film and was definitely my favorite when I was growing up. I wore the VHS tape out. I can definitely believe that because I think it was no more than five seconds after you got done with Office Space. You said, if you guys are ever doing Ghostbusters, I said, well, you're in luck. So what, three months down the road, we're we're now at this or four months down the road? Something like that. But nevertheless, VHS tapes, I think you only had to watch them five times before they wore out. Uh, Not true, as I apparently proved with Peter Pan when I was, what, two? You would watch it five times in a day. (sighs) I'm aware. Anyway, tonight for our 214th episode, and without further ado, we discuss one of the biggest and most influential comedies ever made. Ghostbusters from 1984, celebrating its 40th anniversary this week. Directed by Ivan Reitman, written by Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis, music by Elmer Bernstein, starring Bill Murray as Peter Venkman, Dan Aykroyd as Ray Stance, Sigourney Weaver as Dana Barrett, Harold Ramis as Egon Spengler, Rick Moranis as Louis Tully, Annie Potts as Janine Melnitz, William Atherton as Walter Peck, and Ernie Hudson as Winston Zeddemore. Recognition for this movie? Ghostbusters was released on June 8th, 1984, to critical acclaim, and became a cultural phenomenon. It was praised for its blend of comedy, action, and horror, and Murray's performance was often singled out for praise. It earned $282.2 million during its initial theater run, making it the second highest grossing film of 1984 in the United States and Canada and the then highest grossing comedy ever. It was the number one film in theaters for seven consecutive weeks and one of only four films to gross more than $100 million that year. Further theatrical releases have increased the total gross to around $295.2 million, making it one of the most successful comedy films of the 1980s. Anyone have a guess as to what the number one film of 1984 was? E.T.? No, that's 82. 1984? So... For what it's worth, and this is not a secret in any format, but 
Originally, the Winston Zeddemore character was supposed to be Eddie Murphy, who was busy doing this movie. Beverly, Beverly Hills, Hills Cop. Cop. Any guesses as to what the other two highest grossing movies of the year were just behind that at over $100 million? I don't know. Temple of Doom and Gremlins. Oh, Gremlins. Oh, I forgot okay. about Gremlins. Yeah, Gremlins It was in the theaters in the, at the same time. Just about. I think it was released on the exact same day. Yeah, I think so. All right, so with that, then here's to round out the top 10, just so you know that it was an exceptional movie year. The Karate Kid was number five, Police Academy six, Footloose seven, Romancing the Stone eight, nine, Star Trek three, The Search for Spock, which I think is actually, by most fans' account, not a good Star Trek movie. I don't know. It is not. And Splash. But, Dad, for any time that you want to do 1984 for Revisionist Almanac, this one does have Revenge of the Nerds. Yes. Also Amadeus, but, you know, that's beside the point. Anyway. I saw Revenge of the Nerds at the theater. I would definitely believe that. As I did this film. Ghostbusters remained among the top three grossing films for 16 straight weeks before beginning a gradual decline and falling from the top ten by late October. It left cinemas in early January 1985 after 33 consecutive weeks. Adjusted for inflation, the North American box office is equivalent to $667.9 million in 2020, making it the 37th highest grossing film ever. Its theme song, Ghostbusters by Ray Parker Jr., was also a number one hit. Ghostbusters was nominated for two Academy Awards in 1985. Any guesses as to what they were? Song? Correct. Special effects? Visual effects, yes. It lost out on visual effects, I don't remember to what. It might have been um, Temple of Doom. And then it lost to Stevie Wonder's I Just Called to Say I Love You from The Woman in What's Red. What's so visually stunning about glowing stones? Don't ask me. This is like Harry Potter losing best makeup to the Iron Maiden. <laughs> We made an old woman look slightly older. (laughs) In a 1989 interview, Reitman said he was upset at the little respect he felt Ghostbusters received and his work was not taken seriously, believing many dismissed it as, quote, just another action comedy. In 2001, the American Film Institute ranked Ghostbusters number 28 on its list of 100 years, 100 laughs, recognizing the best comedy films. In 2009, National Review ranked Ghostbusters number 10 on its list of the 25 best conservative movies of the last 25 years, noting the regulation-happy EPA is portrayed as the villain and it is the private sector that saves the day. In November 2015, the screenplay was listed number 14 on the Writers Guild of America's 101 Funniest Screenplays. In 2017, the BBC polled 253 critics 118 of them female, 135 of them male, from across 52 countries on the funniest film made. Ghostbusters came 95th. Ghostbusters is considered one of the best films of the 1980s, appearing on several lists based on this metric, including number two by Film.com, number five by Time Out, number six by Shortlist, number 15 by Complex, number 31 by Empire, and it appears on film site's non-ranked list. It also appeared on several media outlets' best comedy film lists, ranked number one by Entertainment Weekly, number four by IGN, number 10 by Empire, number 25 by The Daily Telegraph, and number 45 by Rotten Tomatoes, which also listed the film number 71 on its essential 200 films to watch. In 2015, the Library of Congress selected it for preservation in the National Film Registry, and Ghostbusters currently has a 95% rating among critics on Rotten Tomatoes, a 60 score on Metacritic, and a 3.8 out of 5 on Letterboxd. So, as we do each week, Dad, what is your relationship to this film? I saw it in the theater. I want to say it was opening weekend. I would have been in uh, the summer of my, uh, or in, well, summer of college. So, I would have probably went and seen it, and I can't remember if I went and saw it with which of the guys who ended up being in my groomsmen in my wedding, but 
probably one of them. Um, so Eric, uh, Andy, Dave, Brett may have been a couple of us, but I do remember going to the theater in Beloit and uh, seeing this film. I be- I'm pretty sure it was opening weekend because anything Bill Murray was in, I was at the uh, ticket counter right away. Even Meatballs? Meatballs was rated, I believe, R, and I couldn't get in because I was too young or I would have. I've still never seen that one, which is surprising that you haven't introduced me to at least one Bill Murray comedy. But, Keith, what is your relationship to the film? Oh, like I mentioned earlier, when I was when I was a kid, this was my favorite. I didn't see this one in the theaters. I was I was too young, but I did see the next one in the theaters when I came out. Uh, in 89, I was excited about that. I'm sorry to hear that. I liked it. I was young enough that it didn't matter to me. It was a kid's movie. There's a lot of reasons why they catered the second one to kids, which is not this topic of conversation, but we're talking about wearing out VHS tapes. I'm going to tell you a great story you don't want to hear. I never, <laughs> Ghostbusters was my favorite movie as a kid, but I never saw the actual movie until I was in my 20s. Because... My parents had a friend who had some sort of like HBO or something along those lines. Uh, They taped the movie off the TV. So it was the made-for-TV version with the commercials. Growing up, I watched this movie probably two or three times a week. Sometimes I'd even watch it twice in one day while I was playing with all my Ghostbusters toys in the living room because... which I I still have several of them. So for me, there were a lot of things that I missed about my favorite movie. And it was strange for the first time I ever saw it. It was also odd watching my favorite movie without commercial cuts. So I um, never wore that tape out. It still worked up until it was destroyed. But uh, yeah, yeah. The, my entire family hates that movie because of me, and I, uh, I had a lot of I had a lot of fun with it. You thought there would just be one, but no, there's actually two stories you don't want to hear. When Obama got reelected, I had just picked up this AR-15, and uh, I didn't really care about it. It was it was stupid, whatever. A lot of people were freaking out because he got put back into office, and overnight. The price of an AR-15 went up fivefold. So I had people messaging me on Facebook saying, hey, sell me your AR-15. One guy was like, I got a buddy, $2,500. He's legit. It's fine. I said, 20? I just spent, fine. So I went over and met this guy. He gave me the cash. Plus, I sold him a handgun, took all that money, went to another friend of mine and said, hey, I know that you have an immaculate, amazing screen reproduction of a Ghostbusters proton pack that was autographed by the cast. Here's the money. And I got it. It was like 40 pounds. It was loud as can be with this giant 15-inch speaker in it. All the lights worked. It was glorious. So uh, then I went out and I bought a flight suit and I made a full Ghostbusters costume and then realized that I wasn't the only one in Stevens Point that was doing the exact same thing. And then uh, another guy I knew, he built the car. So we started just getting together as a group of friends and going around and doing conventions. And one of them was the groomsman in my wedding. That's how we met was Ghostbusters. So it definitely has some connective tissue so yeah. far. Yeah, quite a bit. And I still watch the movie with some frequency. I don't even know if Allison's even, my wife has even seen it. I don't know. It's fun. So I don't want to show it to her because I don't want it to be spoiled. So <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, uh, I made that that's, mistake. that's it for me. I've gave you a, probably a yeah. earful more than you were open for. Yeah. There's a strong, uh, proclivity of the women in my family to uh, refer to all comedies as stupid. Well, 
it would be interesting to see what some of these lists are like post Me Too when you realize that Venkman professes to carry around a date rape drug for his first date. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get yeah. to classicness down the road here. Um, okay. Yeah. Adam, what's your relationship to the movie? Oh, I sleep with it under my pillow. No, um... <laughs> That's Venkman level attachment. <laughs> as I said, I wore this movie out when I was a kid. I watched it two, three times a Saturday morning till I was like eight or nine. I had the all the action figures and I was the coolest kid in the block because I had the old Ghostbusters house that was about two and a half feet tall and you could drive the car out of and... Um, I also have the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man, which I still do, which I've recently saw in an antique store selling for like $1,800 out of the box. And I went, uh, if I didn't like it, I would maybe consider that. Definitely have two pictures of me as a kid in various Ghostbuster costumes, mostly because you could turn a snowsuit into a Ghostbusters costume and it wouldn't ruin your costume that way. I had the trap on my hip. While I was never as fancy as Keith with, with the actual proton pack, I had a shoebox that we black taped and had an old Foden cord that went to the the gun. So yeah, spent a lot of time on this movie. Watch it probably at least once a year now still. Makes me giggle. One of my favorite movies of all time. Well, that's good because this is one of those movies that I think I've I saw so many times in my youth that I don't remember the first time I saw it. I have no clue. That being said, it's just not something that I've oddly returned to very often. I can't tell you the last time before watching it for this week that I'd seen the movies. Uh, I think I'd seen Afterlife, and I'm not sure the last time before that I'd seen any of the originals. I don't even remember if I've seen all of two or not. I think I've seen clips and maybe parts of it at various times, but I don't think I ever actually like fully watched two. And I never watched the female led one. I was so psyched for two when it finally came out, and I was... As I think most Americans well, were. What, what happened to that movie was not long after the original one came out, they came out with the cartoon, less than two years later. And the cartoon was a huge hit with kids, including me. I absolutely loved it. So then when they were putting out another movie, there was that conversation like, hey, you guys know that the last movie was really popular with kids. Plus, there's this cartoon now. So we're going to dial back on the language and we're going to dial back on the innuendo. Nobody in this movie is going to smoke. There's, there's going to be a little bit more of a family audience attending this. So they wrote that with that in mind. That So that was... That was the mindset that, that permeated the entirety of, of the, the creation of that film, which then sort of tainted, I think, a lot of the different... It's, it's the same reason why people don't like the Star Wars episodes 1, 2, and 3 as much. Because they made three movies for adults, and then they turned around and they made three movies for kids. If they had just made three more movies for adults, the kids would have liked it just as much. And they wouldn't have been pandering. And that's what happened to Ghostbusters 2. And that's that's not my opinion. That's Ivan Reitman's opinion. Did I just hear you acknowledge on mic in a recording that I'm keeping that the first three Star Wars films exist? Yeah. Yeah, because you had... Because uh, it started with A New Hope. And then, then, then there was Empire Strikes Back and The Return of the Jedi. And then it went back and did... You knew I meant the prequels. And yeah, the prequels. Uh, there was the Christmas special. Then there was the, the Ewok one. And then there was the third one. I don't I don't remember. So so we're, we're not acknowledging the existence of Jar Jar? <laughs> okay. Yeah, he said for many years that he does not acknowledge the prequel trilogy. Yeah, Misa don't think so. Just another confirmation. Anyway... While this uh, question may be a little bit more difficult for a film that's this silly, what is this film about? I don't know how much any of you have delved into this, but this was a weird project that Dan Aykroyd had been 
bouncing around in his head for a very long time. So he grew up around a, a family that uh, had seances on their farm and there were mediums in the family and they would tell each other ghost stories. And to a degree, they actually believed a lot of these things. So Dan Aykroyd wanted to make this action movie in his heart. He's still kind of a comedian and he was trying to pair the two of them together. So what I think that the movie is supposed to be is, is this, uh, this paranormal, paranormal journey with jokes in it. And his original version is completely different from the final version which led to this really fun Harold Ramis quote that I think works on a lot of different things. He says, when you make a movie, you make three movies. There's a movie you want to make, the movie you actually make, and then the movie that people see. So whatever version of this movie, whether it be the initial concept or what came out, it's a paranormal exploration slash action comedy movie. I, I, don't, I don't know what else to call it because they didn't know what to call it either still don't this is how to flirt with a girl that doesn't want you that's what this movie is about <laughs> yeah it worked though didn't it i don't know she ended up as a dog does, does that count <laughs> well she was the gatekeeper i mean i suppose this strategy worked in the 1980s i think you'd get pepper sprayed long before uh that in 2024 it was negging before negging was cool. <laughs> I don't know. I would, I'm would. i in the same vein as Keith. And while it's not specifically aimed at kids, it's not not for kids who kind of like the macabre and the paranormal, but it's funny enough to be engaging to a general audience, and it wasn't honed in on one specific niche of people. Because I think that Ghosts and Paranormal could be limited if you wanted it to be. But this didn't feel limited. This felt accessible to a mass audience in a way that I, I don't think you get with a lot of other paranormal or ghost-related activities. The initial version, they were going to cross in dimensions and travel in space and do all this funky stuff. That's what he had actually written. And then Harold Ramis was was brought in because he was also kind of a, a script doctor to, to be like, oh, oh, let's let's rein this back a little bit. And then Ivan came in and between the three of them, they said, we actually have to film this somehow. So we're going to do this again. We're going to keep some elements of what you got going on, but we got to make this something that we can do on camera because that's originally what, what the car was for is it wasn't just to to look cool it was actually going to like shift dimensions and, you know, like go to the core of the earth and do all this crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. They were going to battle demons and uh, the devil and all kinds of other things. That That's initially what it was going to be. Again, plenty of stories you don't. So they ended up, he went over to Harold Ramis's house and they sat down and they had some adult beverages and from from what I understand is he had to he had to be like, hey, I'm not here to take away from what it is that you've you've created, because it was their first time really sitting down with one another in real life ever. And then they stayed at Harold Ramis's house and then just worked it and worked it and worked it until they got it down to something that could actually be be made. And now it makes me almost kind of wonder that. With the technology that we have, could we go back and make the original version all over again? How interesting would that be? I think some people would scream bloody murder. Well, I mean, we, we did in 2016, and, you know, they, they did it anyway. <laughs> well, and that kind of leads me into the next question. Is this franchise still as big as it once was? I mean, we've now had a remake, which is supposed to be all female. We've had two kind of estranged sequels or roughly related. And I, I liked Afterlife. I thought Afterlife was pretty good. I don't think Frozen Empire for most people has been as successful as Afterlife was. But you wonder with the cultural phenomenon that this was, does it still have the same type of resonance 
as the 80s. I don't think so because you don't have the cartoon with tens of millions of kids sitting in front of the TV every week waiting for it to come on. If you had that, then I'd say, yeah. I think there's some loss to ghost stories aren't as big as they used to be. Even when I was in in grade school, we had those stories to tell after dark that were popular and bought out every single book fair. And those books aren't as big anymore. And I'm not sure if that's a shift with the advent of of the internet and everybody fact-checking everything every two seconds, even seven and eight-year-olds, or if it's just kind of a loss of this paranormal storytelling. But I don't think there's a draw as a general rule to to ghosts or ghost stories. I think it would have made a big difference if the script coming back out that's been more modern had been just a a slam dunk. But I think it was okay, and I think it really never re-energized the um the franchise i mean they waited so long for the sequel because the uh producers and murray and uh Aykroyd and and uh ramus were fighting with the studio over the profits and they were in litigation for a number of years and it wasn't until they finally settled it that they agreed then to do the sequel because up until then they were withholding doing the sequel and uh it, it, I think that kind of limited it. I mean, I think this is more of a film that was impactful at the time. I don't think it's as big a th- deal as a sequel and as any franchise as they thought it might be. And as far as the recent ones, you know, the loss of, of Harold Ramis, I think, is is felt with with the lack of some of the wit I mean, his writing was always that quick, witty repartee, and it's it's a little missing from the, the new ones. Well, I don't think you have some of the same personalities as you once did. Obviously, Ramus being kind of the straight man in this whole thing, and then the rather overly dry, sarcastic wit that Murray brought to it. I just don't think that you're going to get that when two of the characters are kids. And Paul Rudd is kind of an everyman. He's not necessarily that he's a possibly good comedic actor. He's not necessarily a good comedian, which I think is a major difference. I think that's a pretty good point is um, because it's got the same title and it's, you know, it's got some lineage in which they're reusing Ivan Wright's son is doing it. So you think, Hey, there's going to be a lot of the same flavor, but, the people who are performing it, you, you can't help be but who you are. And yeah, it does change the dynamic of it, especially when the original members that are, are still with us were kind of relegated to a support role. They, they almost have, maybe have the biggest hand in even writing their own lines. They uh, were just kind of given them, so they were, they were participating not starring and that you're right it it did make the the tone a lot a lot different and that that almost makes me a little more forgiving about these these two new ones that have come out which i'd have zero issues with at all i love them but thinking about it that way almost kind of makes them better movies because they're not trying to be what was and i i like that and I would say that even though, I, and I still haven't seen Frozen Empire, but Afterlife I thought was good in alluding to the past without necessarily sacrificing to bring it in. It was incorporating, but didn't necessarily, but wasn't overly fan servicey about it. And I think that often when we get these sequels that are so far into the future, they tend to have a fan service nature and try and serve the people that are going to come back around for these things as opposed to actually trying to make a good movie that's in the same universe. Put it this way. The uh, 1970 Packers, Green Bay Packers. That's sports for all you movie nerds. 
even though that it was the same franchise and they kept bringing back certain players to coach, just never was able to achieve the same level of success as the original 1960s Packers under Lombardi. And I think that's what we're talking about here. They've packaged it in a way it's the same franchise. And now they've brought back Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd, but it's just not, it's just not the same. So dad, are you ready to give us a little more background on this? Do you have a plot summary ready for us? I do. Ghostbusters directed by Ivan Reitman is a spirited blend of comedy, supernatural elements and special effects that coalescence into an exuberant cinematic experience. The film chronicles the journey of three parapsychologists, Peter Venkman, Bill Murray, Ray Stans, Dan Aykroyd, and Egon Spengler, Harold Ramis, who, after being expelled from their university, establish a ghost-catching business in New York City. Their operation, branded as Ghostbusters, quickly gains notoriety as they confront increasingly malevolent spectral entities, culminating in a climactic battle against the ancient Sumerian deity Gozer. Ghostbusters is a testament to the power of well-crafted comedy and imaginative storytelling. It transcends into genre conventions, offering an escapist adventure that is both thrilling and delightfully absurd. Thank you. Did you know? Almost none of the scenes were filmed as scripted. Most had at least one ad lib. Most of Bill Murray's lines, in fact, were ad libbed. Did you know? In the middle of the film's initial release, to keep interest going, Ivan Reitman ran a trailer that was basically the commercial the Ghostbusters used in the movie, but the 555 number was replaced with a 1 800 number, allowing people to actually call in. Callers got a recorded message of Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd saying something to the effect of, Hi, we're out catching ghosts right now. They got 1,000 calls per hour, 24 hours a day, for several weeks. Did you know? Murray left acting for four years following the release of Ghostbusters. He described the success as a phenomenon that would forever be his biggest accomplishment, and, compounded by the failure of his personal project, The Razor's Edge, he felt radioactive. Murray avoided central roles in films until the 1988 Christmas comedy film Scrooged, which used the tagline that Murray was, quote, back among the ghosts. Did you know? On the set, Dan Aykroyd referred to the Slimer ghost as the ghost of John Belushi. Slimer's gluttonous eating was based on Belushi's cafeteria scene in National Lampoon's Animal House. Did you know? When told Ghostbusters had been selected for preservation in the National Film Registry, Ivan Reitman responded, It's an honor to know that a movie that begins with a ghost in the library now has a spot on the shelves of the Library of Congress. Did you know? William Atherton said fans would call him dickless on the streets into the 1990s to his ire. (laughs) And with that, we will take our first break and we will be right back. Before we jump back into the episode, next week for our 215th episode, we welcome new guest Scott Cole of the Movie Friends Pod to discuss a seminal classic of the 1970s for its 50th anniversary, Chinatown from 1974, written and directed by Roman Polanski with Robert Towne, music by Jerry Goldsmith, starring Jack Nicholson, Faye Dunaway, Burt Young, and John Huston. You won't want to miss that one, so watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. I would also like to give a shout out. We've been tracking for many, many years. Well, I guess five now. This is the fifth season of the show. But (laughs) all the countries that uh, we've had listenership in, and we have a new one to add. Anyone want to take a guess? Canada? (laughs) No, Canada has been one of our avid listeners for quite a while now. Malawi. Not too far away, Dad, but we've had Malawi before. Shout out to our Malawi listeners. Turks and Caicos. Nope, not quite. So I would like to give a special shout out to the listeners in Lesotho. And for those of you who are not familiar with world geography, 
that is a landlocked country surrounded entirely by South Africa. Wait, you're just getting listeners from there now? Yes. But you've been doing this for five years. I know. We should have had it much sooner. It's hard to break into the Lizothian market. I know. We were the uh, top show in our demographic, number one, in Singapore for a long time. We're not currently, but we're still pretty high up the charts in Singapore for whatever that's worth. Got that going for us. Which, which is, is nice. nice. Jinx. All right. With that, that takes us to our new segment, Ask Dana Anything. Are we ready? Oh, I'm always ready. First question from our friend Andrew Corns of the Revisionist Almanac. I can hardly wait. Are you a Twinkie man? And if not... What's your go-to hostess snack? There is a follow-up question on top of this. I'm glad he asked the second question because I'd have to really question Mr. Corns. No, I am not a Twinkie man. I am a Ho-Ho's or Ding Dong's fan because to me, Twinkies are kind of like puffed air with some cream or like a sweet cream in the middle. Never was a big Twinkies fan. Much preferred the chocolate, devil's food cake. Okay, his follow-up question on top of that. Also, what is your go-to snack to compare supernatural activity to? My go-to snack. In the movie, he compares supernatural or, yes, supernatural paranormal activity to a Twinkie. Okay. So what would you use as a food to compare paranormal activity to? And make sure it can be made big. Because that's a big Twinkie. Yeah. A Snickers bar. That's not a bad one. That is America's favorite candy bar. The piece of candy that makes the most appearances in the film is a Crunch Bar. Fair point. All right. Question number two from our friend Kieran B. of the Best Picture cast. If Dana were on the rooftop for the final scene and he was unable to properly clear his head, which final foe would come stomping around the block? Hmm. Hmm. Winnie the Pooh. That is not what I was expecting, but you and a honeypot makes sense. Because I'd be looking at the most innocuous thing like like Ackroyd was. Something that would not harm, harm anybody, but yes, a, a giant Winnie the Pooh with a honeypot. You clearly did not see what was universally panned as the worst film of last year. Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. (laughs) Okay, I was not aware of that film. I believe it's available to you. You just have to go looking for it, but it is a Winnie the Pooh horror film. Uh, It's okay. I don't need to. Uh, Okay. Uh, All right, that's enough asking anything for right now. So let's move to best performance. Dad, who did you have down? I had Bill Murray. Does everyone else have Bill Murray? I don't. I don't either. I don't either. Wow. Wow. Okay. So I'm on an island. So, Dad, apparently, yeah, you're out on a limb here with your choice. Why Bill Murray? Because I think Bill Murray's star power really carried the film. I think his zip one-liners at times were the uh, the comic relief within the film. And I just thought that um, if you put anybody else in that role, the film is not as, as successful. Keith? Rick Moranis. <laughs> okay. that That's an interesting choice. You laugh, but I actually have him as my secondary. The reason why I chose that, John Candy was initially going to play that role. And they had a lot of things that were already written for him. So when Rick Moranis came in, he didn't he wasn't really given any lines. He made all of that up. Like the entirety of the dialogue when he's having the party, that was just one take and he just made that up on the spot. Like that that wasn't written. And the thing with with him is he he had to create this character out of nothing. Bill Murray was playing Bill Murray. Is kind of what he does. Rick Moranis, he had to play two different characters and he had to come up with all of it on the fly after filming had already been going on for some time. And I think if if you had to had John Candy in his role, 
it still would have been good, but in a different way. But yeah, Rick, Rick Moranis for me is the one that, that just killed it. Let me ask, is there ever a non-nerd that's named Lewis? <laughs> uh, Lewis Black. He said non-nerd. Yeah. Lewis Black's not a nerd. Oh, he's such a nerd. No, he's just an angry Jew. In what movie is he named Lewis, though? Well, I mean, he didn't limit it to a, you know, to a movie character. He just said anybody named, is there ever somebody named Lewis that's not a nerd? It just seems in popular culture, Lewis has come to mean nerd. There's just some names that automatically go with some things. No one is going to go to a garage where the guy's name is Maurice. No, nothing about the name Maurice ever sounds like they're going to know what they're talking about when they're trying to fix your car. Uh, I Okay, never mind. I can't I can't do that one. I can't do that joke. Okay, moving on. Adam, who did you have? Honestly, Harold Ramis is the one that sells the movie for me. The movie doesn't work without somebody who can provide a straight lace scientific role when talking about absolute nonsense. And without his character to be a, a foil and a counterpoint, nobody else's performance is as funny or as meaningful. So we all went with different best performers on this one because I have Dan Aykroyd. Mm. I think he brings a childlike wonder to the film. And as I was watching it back again, particularly the scene where they're first going to the fire department or whatever, they're looking around and you get Bill Murray is kind of the sarcastic dad. Egon is the no nonsense mom and Aykroyd's running around the place. Like he's the kid at a new house. And can we just stay overnight just to try it out? I want to go get my stuff. He brings a certain childlike wonder, which is necessary for the interest in the film to gravitate towards kids who like the macabre and the occult and all of these other things. It's why I think this movie works as well as it does. And subsequently, like Tim Burton films were well attended for years. There's a certain group of the population that enjoys this paranormal type of scary, dark, unusual stuff that may be out of the norm per se. And the one difference I would say between this and like Tim Burton stuff is this is actually funny. Tim Burton's just trying to be slightly, but it it doesn't often work, at least for me. But Dan Aykroyd came up with the original idea. He had most of the execution in the writing and the concept. And I think his character is one of the more important linchpins to the film. By the way, when I saw that scene again of Aykroyd in the firehouse, it's your mother every time we've tried to buy a house. Every time I would go in and say, just be deadpan. Otherwise, they're going to jack up the price. Oh, I love this. We have to have this house. <sighs> so yet again, where uh, mom is not a, a good poker face. <laughs> no. And given all of our proximity to her, let's move on. Best secondary dad, you already said that you had Rick Moranis. Yep. The character is just phenomenal. And, uh, he comes across as being a believable nerd. It's not a lampoon per se, but I mean, I've known people that were not very far off from him. Right. And I think this could have gone into a very absurdist point of view. I think it could have been very easy to take that character and make him unbelievable. But for him to be able to take it and make it comedic and memorable is an accomplishment. However, I went with Ivan Reitman just for the tone and for wrangling all of these various parts together. I mean, it could have been a very distinct movie to itself because all of these comedy styles didn't necessarily blend together on their own, in my opinion, probably very well. Murray with his sarcastic point of view. Then you have Aykroyd with his kind of... Uh, unusual absurdist humor Ramus with much more of his straight laced down the line, but can operate within those, those realms. I think creating the tone and tenor and pace of this movie was an important aspect to making it palatable to most people and getting as many laughs as you possibly could. So I think the accomplishment that he, of his direction overall for the film is why I would go secondary for him. 
And what part did he play, being as this is a performance award? You clearly don't listen to the show. We often do directors in these categories. We've done cinematographers. We've done choreographers. And I make the same joke in my head every time you do. <laughs> okay. Well, most charismatic, you're not going to like where I go next then. Well, I don't have a problem with that. I'm just curious. Okay. So then who is your best secondary performer? Yeah. For me, it's Ernie Banks. The The Winston character could have felt like a tack on. And instead, he when he's introduced, enriches the movie in so many ways and is a believable guy who just gets thrust into this world and goes, holy crap, where did I end up? Are we going to redo or point out that you referred to him as Ernie uh, Banks I was going to say, but to Ernie Hudson. Yeah, that, that's fine. Ernie Hudson. Somebody with too much baseball on the brain. Yes. Unfortunately, the Cubs. I mean, you had to go with a Cubs player. My hatred for the Cubs knows no bounds. Anyway. Keith, who's your best secondary? Like Adam mentioned, since we're picking anybody, another guy named Adam was the second key grip. I think, uh, I think for me, without without him, I mean that stuff that stuff gets heavy. And if you're not prepared for when them lines are being delivered, and then the sound, it's just Bill Murray. He he comes up with a quip. He's only got so many in his ammunition pouch. And if you're not there to get it, then you missed out on a good chunk of one of the best performances in the movie, which is why I would put Bill Murray as, as third. I know you guys only get two, but I'll put Bill Murray in there as the third behind the, the key grip. Just just because of that uh, that kind of that, that dark wit, because it's the, the, the movie is really is really kind of out there. And the thing that I think keeps it on pace and the reason why it's I keep saying palatable because it reached such a wide audience. What he does is he, he makes it so that anybody can enjoy it because he's keeping it on the level. He's not letting it go too far in one direction or the other. And much like Harold Ramis's character is, is there to be the, the straight man. He is there to even out the performances in, in, in the comedy and the action and everything. I, I, th- I think without him, as was mentioned before, you, you end up not having the, the same movie. And I don't know if that movie would have been as good. All right. For most charismatic, I've already prefaced it a little bit, but I have the song Ghostbusters. It is the catchiest thing about the entire movie for me. The minute it's done playing because it's the credit song as well as the kind of like background theme to everything that's going on, I have it as an earworm all day. So for me, that's my most charismatic. Agree or disagree. Keith, let's go back to you. Most charismatic. I'm going to go with another performer. I'm going to go with the public works guy that was brought in to shut down the, uh, the power to the building. Atherton? No, not Atherton. Oh, it was the he was just the public works guy. He was the only one in a hard hat, and he had a tool belt, and he he was just kind of hanging out, just chilling, like "What's up, everybody?" And then they're like, "Shut this down." He's like, "I I don't know how this works," and they were like, "Shut it down," and they just like he he was they were just attacking him, like "Shut it down, you shut it down, and I'll sue you." Hey, huh? And he's just like, and then just runs away, like he's the first one out the door. Adam, is your most charismatic? The mayor? Well, I had Bill. Uh, yes, absolutely. It's the mayor. No, it's it's, it's the cardinal. <laughs> <laughs> Let me come in and dispense some sage wisdom that has absolutely no relevance. <laughs> uh, leave it to the clergy. So who did you have? In all seriousness, for me, it is... It, Bill Murray's character is the one that's charismatic. He's he's the one that draws people to this movie and keeps people coming back and the only one with any sort of charisma on the screen. I had Bill Murray and for much the same reasons, the same reason I thought he was best performance. But I will give you a shout out to uh, somebody that I thought came across rather charismatic for a small role really kind of made an impression on me, and that's Annie Potts. 
I really liked her character. And from this, she ended up on Designing Women, and she's done a lot of different things since. But I thought her character in this was very uh, well done for the small role she had and uh, was memorable. Okay, that moves us to best scene then. I'm sure you'll have some additional nominees to make, but I have Ghost in the Library, Catching Slimer, Gatekeeper Keymaster, which I'm sure will be my dad's favorite scene, At the Mayor's Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. So what did I miss? The scene with Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray discussing their ouster from the university (laughs) and discussing the, the difference between being in the university where they give you facilities and monies and shifting over to the private sector where they actually expect results. It is one of the... As I've grown older, it was funny when I was a kid just because everybody laughed. And as I grew to understand and relate to it, it's a scene that resonates with me for a long time. Anybody else add anything? The scene immediately following that, I was going to choose that one as well. Just because uh, he passes the bottle back over to him and it says, what are we going to do? I don't know, Ray. I don't know. And then the next scene is them coming out of the bank. And he's telling him to uh, to relax because everybody has five mortgages these days. My parents left me that house. I was born there. Ray, for your information, the interest rate alone comes to $274,000. 19%? You didn't even bargain with the guy. <laughs> <laughs> that also sounds uh, something my mother would do. Uh, but that was about what interest rates were back then, too. Yeah. Thanks, Reagan. I got one more, uh, again, because you didn't ask for it. So the whole time is the movie is building, and uh, the end scene, which is actually comes after the credits, which I never saw until this year. I saw this particular scene for the first time with, with Rick Moranis. See, everybody is coming out of the building, and everybody's cheering them, and they're putting blankets on them, and they're high-fiving and they're kissing and doing all this other stuff. Well, then they load up in the car and they take off. Well, eventually Rick Moranis' character, he comes out of the building and he goes, hey, everybody. And as soon as he walks out, the Red Cross runs up and like snatches him, throws a blanket on him and starts ushering him into their van. And he's like, no, 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 I'm one of them. I want to go with them in the car. And then they just shove him in the van and they take off. It's great. I don't know why I ever missed that, but I I laughed so hard when I saw that. I don't know how I missed it for 40 years. Ah, deprived youths. All right, so for your nominations, we have Ghost in the Library, Ouster from the University, Third Mortgage, Catching Slimer, Gatekeeper Keymaster, At the Mayor's, Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man, and End Credits. Out of these, what is the best scene? It's it's the library for me, for reasons. I mean, the psychoanalysis that precedes the, the library. Do you have anyone who's crazy in your family? I have an uncle who believes he's St. Jerome. That, that one, that is pretty pretty memorable. But it, for me, it's the mayors. I mean, the, the literary references, the quick wit and humor, the comparing dogs and cats living together to mass hysteria. One of these things is not like the other. That's the scene that, as an adult, has made me laugh more than any other. Yeah, I I like the library because it showed all three characters in there. So when Bill Murray is going down into the library, you kind of wonder, does he even, does he believe in any of these things? Like, is he along? Because he's so unemployable that he has to hang out with these guys because they're the only ones that are going to tolerate him or give him any money whatsoever. Meanwhile, one is being scientific and the other one is a kid in a candy store about the entirety of this experience. Then they actually encounter the ghost. Then that's the first time in which all three of them are on the same plane. It doesn't matter how smart or how excited or how whatever, they're all now equally scared and running equally fast out the door. That's why I love it. That's that's a cool scene. Mine is, of course, 
the gatekeeper and the key master. Only because you've used that to uh, talk about sex to all of us kids for 20 years. It so captures the dynamics that is marriage. Uh, and leaving it there. <laughs> uh, Which part of marriage is talking to the horse and telling him to not worry? <laughs> <laughs> That's the dementia part. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I have Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. That is an absurdist scene which could go so wrong in so many ways and yet somehow still works on many different levels down to actually frying this giant puffy white dude that looks like the Pillsbury Doughboy but isn't. I, I think it could have gone very wrong, but it somehow has become one of the most iconic scenes of the 1980s. And so I would put it up there against most anything else as far as point to one scene from the 1980s. This might be in your top 10. All right. Favorite scene? I have Catching Slimer. I just think it's really the kind of true takeoff point. When they're in the library, you kind of get a feel for the characters as they're being set up. You get an understanding of how each of them is interacting, what their kind of relationship is. But until you get to the Slimer scene, you don't see the Ghostbusters in their fully actualized form, where you don't need the setup. You can have them operating within character, chasing down a ghost for the first time. And so I think it's really the true launching point for the rest of the movie. I have the same scene as Gatekeeper and Keymaster. It's always the one that I find the most enjoyable. I mean, the chase of the the dog or the bear or whatever. I mean, the whole thing is just hilarious to me. I've always enjoyed it. And uh, so that's why not only is it the best scene to me, it's my favorite. Well, I, I think I outed myself in the nomination part. The The ouster from the university is my my favorite scene. It's the fun, one of the funniest to me, and it was one I didn't get as a kid, and I got now as an adult and gave me a new appreciation for the film. Yeah, for that reason, it's my favorite. I'm agreeing with you with the, the Slimer. For, for the reason that for me, it's the one that's consistently been my favorite. So we mentioned earlier about when we were kids and we'd have this movie on in the in the background and uh, we'd be on the floor playing with our our toys and running around and make pretending and the whole nine that entire scene i would always stop whatever i was doing and i would go and watch everything that took place in the in the sedgwick hotel just because that that was so cool showing up for the first time with the car showing up for the first time with the stuff and they're actually going out in there capturing the ghost it's it's an action scene like there's there's some funny in it but it's not a funny sequence it's an action sequence and it's uh probably in my opinion the best sequence in the movie most indelible moment i'll make mine quick i kind of already tipped off with uh my best scene but i think it's the stay puff marshmallow man I think it's the thing that really translates the most out of anything from this movie and has become its own iconic thing, partially because it's not based on any other branding. So it, it is truly original to this film, and I think culturally is one of the things that you can really point to. If you say to anybody, stay puffed marshmallow man, they know what you're talking about. At least in American culture. I don't know if they would know in Lizotho. I don't know. I The mayor's office to me stays with the indelible too because of the the literary references and, and the the callbacks and the various things that are in it the humor and the the cardinal of course and of course the cardinal yeah how you doing mike <laughs> not too bad lenny and then you know seeing the the political machine with it you know you will have saved the lives of millions of registered voters um, <laughs> that that line is is just yeah to me that's that's it 
Well, for me, it's uh, the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. I remember being in the theater and Aykroyd's like doing everything he can to say without saying what he thought of. And then all of a sudden comes around the corner of the building, this, you know, giant marshmallow man. And you just bust out laughing because never in a million years did you think that this was going to be what was going to be the doomsday mechanism. I got to pick the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, too. I, I'm i jealous the fact that I wasn't old enough to go see this in the theater because I think seeing this with a group of people who are also seeing it for the first time, there's there's an energy when you're in a room with people, even though you're not interacting with them. And uh, you, you feed off that. I think that that's one of the many reasons why people still like to go see movies at the movies. And it's, it's is a very iconic movie as its own special place in a lot of people's hearts for a lot of different reasons. And we all covered a multitude of, of them and why, why we like them so much, but to experience that for the first time, I mean, I don't remember seeing the movie for the first time. I don't remember the state book marshmallow man for the first time, but if I were in a room with a hundred other people, then I definitely would have remembered it. If we all had a, so it's, it's one of my favorites and it's the one that I'm most jealous that I did not get to experience in, in the theater. The rest of the movie probably would have been fine seeing it at home for the most part, but that's must have been one of those scenes. Not I'm not being lazy by just picking the same one that you are. I was actually thinking about that too. It's not lazy. We've often had ones where the most indelible is universally shared because they're just something so iconic that it, it pops out. But that takes us to our second commercial break. We'll be right back. Before we jump back into the episode, and before we get to the Stanley rubric in a minute, if you're ever curious about our Master Greatest Movies of All Time list that has every graded movie we've ever discussed on the show, there's a link in the episode description of every episode of this show, or you can go to RonnieDuncanStudios.com and find it as the top entry on the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast show page. That has the grades we've done so far for all 196 movies we've graded, and we continue to add more each week. Make sure to check that out as we go and follow along. Also, you can follow each individual episode on our website as well. That has the notes for each individual episode with all of our scores, category nominations, and the individual factoids for each episode of this show. You just click the link in the episode description of this episode or go to RonnieDuncanStudios.com backslash Gmote podcast to find that. Dad, do we have anyone to remember this week? Yes. Brother Marquis, 58, American rapper, two live crew. Janice Page, 101, American Actress, Please Don't Eat the Daisies, stage performance. Pajama Game, stage performance. It's Always Jan, TV, and Silk Stockings, the film. Eric Anderson, 66 or 67, American Actor. Friday the 13th, The Final Chapter, Bat 21, Unfaithful. Mitchell Block, American film producer, No Lies, Big Mama, Poster Girl, The Testimony. Maria de Aragon, 81, American actress, Star Wars, A New Hope, was the woman behind the Greedo mask. The original Greedo, for anyone that uh, believes Han shot first. Anyway, we remember these here fondly for their contributions with a moment of silence here in their honor. Thank you. And we make the awkward transition to best funniest lines. I will start off with one of the obvious ones. Ray, everything was fine with our system until the power grid was shut off by dickless here. Peck, they caused an explosion. Mayor, is this true? Venkman, yes, it's true. This man has no dick. I alluded to it earlier, but do you have anyone with significant psychiatric symptoms in your family? I have an uncle who thinks he's in, he's St. Jerome. 
I'd call that a big yes. <laughs> mine's mine's a short one. It was Dan Aykroyd in the library. Listen, do you smell something? <laughs> Minkman, we came, we saw, we kicked its ass. Winston with possibly the line of the movie. Ray, when someone asks you if you're a god, you say yes. Oh, that's a good one. I've been in the private sector. They expect results. If there's a steady paycheck in it, I'll believe anything you say. Ray, I think we better split up. Egon, good idea. Vinkman, yeah, we can do more damage that way. That's a good one. Vinkman, this city is headed for a disaster of biblical proportions. What do you mean by biblical? Ray, what he means is Old Testament, Mr. Mayor. Real wrath of God type stuff. Venkman, exactly. Ray, fire and brimstone coming down from the skies, rivers and seas boiling. Egon, 40 years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes. Winston, the dead rising from the grave. Venkman, human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. <laughs> yep, each of us with an unlicensed nuclear accelerator on our backs. Oh well, better turn me on cutscene to everyone sliding over in the elevator. <laughs> I have... Ray, Ray, come in. Egon, I'm with Venkman. He's been slimed. That's great, Ray. Save some for me. I'm out. Venkman, we've been going about this all wrong. This Mr. Stay Puff's okay. He's a sailor. He's in New York. We get this guy laid, we won't have any trouble. Oh, good lord. I love that one. <laughs> when they actually shoot the maid's cart, and she says, What the hell do you think you're doing? They said, Sorry. We thought you were someone else. <laughs> $1,500? That's outrageous. I won't pay it. I had no idea it would be that, that expensive. Oh, well, we can go ahead and just put it right back in there. Yep. <laughs> Dana Barrett, I want you inside me. Venkman. Go ahead. No, I can't. It, it sounds like you've got at least two or three people in there already. <laughs> you usually don't see that kind of behavior in a major appliance. Where do these stairs go? They go up. <laughs> <laughs> this job is definitely not worth thirteen five a year. <laughs> Venkman, are you Alice menstruating right now? Library administrator. What has that got to do with it? Back off, man. I'm a scientist. <laughs> Anybody got any more yet? I still got two. Oh, I'd have to think, so fire away. Okay. Janine. Oh, that's very fascinating to me. I read a lot myself. Some people think I'm too intellectual, but I think it's a fabulous way to spend your spare time. I also play racquetball. Do you have any hobbies? I collect spores, molds, and fungus. <laughs> Dana Barrett that's the bedroom but nothing ever happened in there Venkman what a crime <laughs> alright if nobody has any more let's move to the Stanley rubric then legacy is up first just so that we don't put our guests on the spot dad do you want to go first or second uh go ahead okay I thought long and hard about giving this a full 10 but I think based partly on the discussion I had in my head, similar to the one we had to lead off the program, and yes, I've had discussions in my own head before you make that joke, I think there's just a little bit where this movie lives somewhat still in the 80s, and even though we had one semi-successful sequel that derived a sequel to itself, I just don't see this as being as culturally relevant or significant to people who didn't quite grow up with this and maybe the kids of today as other franchises of that ilk. And so by extension, I'm going to give it a half point down because I still do think this is a very overwhelmingly culturally significant film on the audience side. I'll give that a 4.5. But for the industry, it's hard to deny. They've been trying to recreate what they created in the 80s three different times by doing a female-led one, by doing a sequel, by doing another sequel. 
they're still trying to seek out what this is because they recognize that this could be something and it was popular then. So maybe if they haven't learned the lessons of before, they still are on this film for a reason. It was a cultural phenomenon. They're still trying to recapture that. So I have a five for the industry. I have a 9.5 overall. Okay. I think your points are very poignant as far as the public. I will say that when I polled the staff on this week about the film, the ones that did not uh, indicate that they had seen the film were those under 30, because I think it's lost some of its luster, especially for the younger crowd, because it's perceived as a, as an older film. And I think it's an eighties film. And I think it resonated with an eighties group, whether you were a small child at that time or whether it was just a product of the time frame. So I, I gave it a, a 4.5 for the public. For the industry, the fact was is they didn't try to do much with this for a long period of time. It was only after we had a whole series of recyclings by Hollywood trying to redo stuff and recapture magic in a bottle at another time frame when they were trying to utilize formulas that they thought might be successful and avoid having problems with expending larger sums of money on a film that did not or would not do well. So they would recycle, recycle TV shows, recycle films, recycle concepts, et cetera. Yes, it is still poignant and still continuing to be successful. So I'm not going to give it much down for it, but I still think there was something lacking in that in-between period of the 80s and the 2010s. So I'm going to give it a 4.5 for the industry for a 9 overall. For the industry legacy, I give it, I do give it the full 5 because this group, this collection of actors from this movie spawned several other movies that stayed within the industry. Stripes, um, some of the other Harold Ramis movies that, you know, this is kind of the spot where Dan and, and Bill forged their friendship. So this is the lead off to Caddyshack. For those reasons, I think it stays within in the higher ranks of the legacy within the industry. So I give it a five for that. However, on the the public side, I'm going with the three because I think some of the jokes, especially post Me Too movement, are flat and tasteless. The The fact that Bill Murray's character is carrying around a date rate drug in his pocket, I think it is is somewhat problematic in, in how the movie would be viewed in a modern audience. Um, and I think that diminishes the film some. So I would normally attribute that almost solely to classicness. It might leak into novelty. Normally we're talking about, for the most part, the reputation of the film when it comes to legacy. And so I'm not sure that I would apply that here, but if you're willing to stick with your eight, regardless, we'll lock you in. Well, I, I can see maybe those points, but the fact that someone who watched it now would have a diminished respect for it because of those points, I think it still fits. So I'm going to stick with my eight. Well, the only reason that I make an argument against that is I don't want one issue to leak into multiple different score points. So you could theoretically on that then take off for legacy, novelty, rewatchability, and classicness if you really had a problem with it in that regard. And so I'd like to limit some of the damage that might be applied in that regard, but I can respect your eight regardless. When I did the ratings for these, I don't consider it in other spots. Okay. Keith, what do you have? Uh, talking about, I had a conversation one time with, with Ernie Hudson, as a matter of fact, uh, in person. And, and I was, was asking about the legacy of this movie and how he thought this was going to move on with the generations and how the different generations would perceive it. And he said, do you want me to sign your action figure or not, kid? And... I said, yes, sir. And then he gave it back to me. And then I, I left the line. But 
the points I'm saying is very similar things to actually what, what Adam is saying. Something can be in a time capsule, but we can we do the same thing when we decide we want to watch new war movies. When we want to watch Casablanca, and we we go ahead and we say that something is a product of its time, and I wonder if not enough time has elapsed for even very young generations of, of people who are maybe 20 to, to think of the 80s as, but I think that's starting to get there. And I think that a lot of the comments that Adam made about some of the things that Bill Murray said in the film are going to be some things that new viewers are going to go, ooh, I, I'm kind of not okay with that. Because that joke probably goes a little too far, and 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 I would I would very much agree that that is going to be the thing. A lot of the uh, uncouth commentary of a sexual nature that happens almost exclusively with his character will be the things that will hold the movie back with some viewers. But other than that. I think that uh, it's going to strengthen with time because it's within that the capsule. And 10 years from now, when the 80s is ancient history, the new viewers are going to lump it in with with E.T. and Gremlins and Stripes and a lot of those movies. And it's 80s time. Well, for a lot of us, that's, uh, you know, that, that was in, within our lifetime. So it, it doesn't have the same the same relevance to us. I ended up giving it a nine. I gave it a five for um, the industry and then a four because of those jokes. The the Thorazine's a big one, you know? I mean, it is what it is. So that's an 8.88 average between the four of us. All right. Does anyone not have a 10 for impact and significance? I don't. You don't? I don't. Okay. I don't. Well, go ahead. I have public as a five because it was so huge in the moment. But even though critics liked it, it wasn't universally liked. I mean, I think I read the review Roger Ebert uh, on his normal, you know, five stars, gave it like three and a half. There were a lot of critics who thought it was kind of, eh, they were okay with it, but it wasn't like the biggest thing or the funniest thing. I, I think a lot of people or a lot of the critics kind of did pan it. And even Reitman was talking about how little credit it got when it was released. I think it was a better film than what a lot of critics and people inside Hollywood thought. It was. And it's, again, one of the reasons why I've thought the Academy has always gotten it wrong by not having a category for comedy versus drama, because I think comedies always get short shifted. So for the industry, I went with a 4.5 because I think people did panned it because it was a comedy as opposed to something more serious and worthy of more attention than it got. See, I'm going to push back on quite a few of those points. Because from an industry standpoint, this was the meal ticket for everybody involved in this movie. They didn't have to do or ask much for anything ever after this for about another 15 years. We had a green light sequel within five years after this movie was made. We had this gigantic box office. And it is the first film since Star Wars that proved the concept that kids were willing to buy movie-themed toys. The amount of toys, memorabilia, other stuff that was capitalized on from this movie to a mass audience, the industry was making tons of money off of this movie that came out of nowhere. And yes, there were several films like that during the 80s. Raiders, E.T., Back to the Future, Ferris Bueller, Top Gun. There were a lot of these out of nowhere type big popcorn popular movies. But to me, this is a 10 out of 10. This is, I don't see where the argument would be otherwise, but I'll take your, you had a nine dead and 9.5. So it was four and a half for industry and five for the public. Okay. 
Anyone else want to weigh in? I, I had a 10, and I'm going to push back a little too because, and this builds off one of Tom's points from earlier in the podcast, when they launched Scrooge, they literally did it on a reference to this movie. And that's within three years of this movie. So to say that the industry didn't recognize it when they're using it as the basis for a tagline for another movie they're trying to sell, I think is a little, dis, maybe not disingenuous, but I think that that point falls a little flat. I think a lot of adults, and Danny, you can argue this point with me or not, that saw it, they were entertained and they had a good time, and then they left the theater, and they went on with with life. But if you were a kid when when this movie was around, this was everything. This was huge. If you went over to a kid's house and he didn't own any Ghostbusters toys, then I mean, you were going to be friends with that kid. I wouldn't be friends with that kid today. Loser. That's what he is. Sorry to know we're not friends. Oh, definitely not. Not at all. Just family. Because you own, yeah, zero, zero of those toys. So I, I think that a lot of the, the cultural impact wasn't with the typical demo, wasn't with the demographic that they were aiming for to the point where they had to change what the franchise was for the second movie to cater to the kids. They had to have a bunch of Nintendo references in it. They had to. They had to do this. They had to do that. They changed the script for that second movie to add things for the children and that constant reminder of this is this is for the kids, but the adults are welcome too. Is the feeling that that movie has? If it had had as big of a cultural impact as we want to claim it has, and it would have a ten, I think that it would have been able to stand on its laurels enough that they would have just let Harold Ramis and Dan Aykroyd write the thing without any interference and just let them do their best with Ivan Reitman to replicate the first movie. And they didn't let him do it. I gave it, I gave it a four and a five. While it's still culturally relevant. I think the relevance has stuck with those who were under the age of 12 when the movie came out. Nine. So that's a 9.63 average between the four of us. Novelty. Adam, let's start with you. I'm not versed enough in film to, to know if this was really the first one that, that bent genres between between comedy and action. But in my life, it's one of the ones that the first ones that I ever remember where I could easily identify that it was was two different types of movies in one and then i also think the the concept of someone catching ghosts aside from the sequels really hasn't been been replicated or even attempted to be replicated or ripped off in in comparisons to things like there's there's lots of gladiator movies there's lots of of king arthur type tales there's lots and and various retellings uh, of shakespeare's so for this one, I, I give it a, a full full 9.5 just because I'm not certain that, that it's the only one that bends genres like that. But the fact that there isn't variations on a theme that exist out there, I think makes it a very high score. Dad, what do you have to say on the subject? It is extremely novel, except that there's two things that I could think of that question the complete novelty of it one is abbott and costello did a whole series of horror comedies with ghosts and there was one with meets frankenstein and one that meets the mummy and all this so that really was the first attempt to blend the genres the next was scooby-doo which again kind of builds off of it So I can't go real high, but I will go an eight and a half for novelty, taking into account that it created a a, a new genre, more or less, but building on some groundwork that was previously done. He does have a point. Well, initially the movie was going to be called Ghost Breakers, 
because Ghostbusters already existed. It was a TV show, and it was a bunch of old-time actors and, and a gorilla, and they ran around kind of slapstick catching ghosts with this little thing. And, and, and they even made a cartoon about it later. So as a kid, Ghostbusters is coming on, and all of a sudden it's, uh, it's Rocky's coach and a gorilla in, in, a, in a hat, and they're catching ghosts, and it's called. Go- I'm like, what the? It, but it was that was the thing first. But when I was a kid, we talked about, you know, getting the tape. I wanted to see the original version of the movie. Whenever we'd go to the video store, would go running around trying to find it. And I remember when I was six or seven years old, and I finally found it. But it was in the comedy section. I'm like, what is this doing here? There aren't any jokes in this movie. Because when you're seven, there are no jokes in that movie. It's an action movie. If you're even younger, it's a horror movie. Or is it a science fiction movie? Like, what? what is it? I, I, I don't know. Is it a comedy first? I don't have a clue. And that's where I agree that it's its, its own thing. And it wasn't trying to exist in a box. It was just doing what it wanted to do. And I don't really know of anything else that's been able to do that. And that's why for me, it's it's a 10. But I won't disagree with anybody that disagrees with me. That's just my personal take on it. So as many of the fans know by this point, I have been splitting the category recently between originality and execution. So from an originality standpoint, I would argue this is a full five. I really don't think there is anything like this that's a sci-fi kind of action comedy. It really exists in its own thing. And there's really been nothing else quite like it. Everything else that's kind of sci-fi adjacent isn't really based in a real world situation. It's still like outer space type of stuff. Even like a Starship Troopers is not really anywhere near what this is. This is paranormal. This is kind of blending genres of comedy, action, horror, multiple things all over the place. So I have a five on that end. But on an execution standpoint, I do think there are a few things to me that just watching it are a little bit lacking. There are a few of the acting performances that are not quite as memorable the more often that you watch it. I think that I could possibly grade it down in classicness but for an example the special effects don't hold up nearly as well as they did at the time the computer graphics aren't just quite as good or as fresh so there's there's a little bit of here and there where i would probably knock it down just slightly to a four on that end and i have a nine so that's a 9.25 average between the four of us so that takes us to classicness I think Adam's been chomping at the bit. What did you factor in for classicness? So for classicness, the for me, the references that were timely at the time, the Casey Kasem reference, the, the locations that are, are throughout New York, the things that made it wonderfully just absolutely 80s. I, I like all those little niche things that are, are throughout the movie that makes it you know, so many so many films are trying to to be timeless or whatever, and this film just kind of owns that it's an '80s film with what it does. And to me, that makes it just that much more classic because it's cementing I am this time period. And so, I gave it a nine point five for that. I gave it a nine point five as well, but without a lot of reason because I didn't know what to say. But it is it is very classic yeah the, the Casey Kasem and uh and Larry King and you know, things things that don't exist anymore but in that time were were everything I I almost wonder how much they paid those people to have cameos in that movie and they were like it's what it's who how much uh I guess Ghostbusters that'll be ten thousand dollars I think it's before Larry King became Larry King, though. No. No? Larry King was Larry King then. Okay. Oh, yeah. 
he wasn't he wasn't quite as huge as he got late eighties, but Larry King was when he first went over to CNN uh, and started doing his TV show. He was already a well or a wildly popular syndicated radio personality out of Los Angeles, and uh, you know everybody knew who Larry King was. All right. Well. I appreciate both of your 9.5s, but I'm going to destroy the average a little bit here. Unfortunately, this is where I factor in all of the doesn't age well stuff. Whether we talk about Bill Murray's rather persistent, almost stalking level of Dana Barrett, the graphics don't look as great, but you know, I kind of already gave points off in another area for this. Its cultural relevance isn't as high as it used to be, which, again, I suppose you could look at a legacy point of view. I will still say that it's funny, but it's becoming less funny as I'm an adult, and because I don't quite have the same nostalgia that certain people that grew up with this film were, it wasn't on for me nearly as often as the two of you. So I'm kind of stuck on a fence-sitting seven. I think there are points to take off for all of the creepiness of Murray's character. At the same time, I think there are elements of timelessness to this. It's still somewhat funny. So that kind of brings me back to even. So I'm at a a fence sitting seven. Normally our classic, this starts at a seven and then goes up or down from there. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to say I'm giving it points down simply because I mean, the opening scene with Bill Murray, he's trying to score with a co-ed half his age by faking results from a study. It's creepy in and of itself. And then he talks about the date rape drug and he's his behavior with Dana to the point of being sexually harassing. You have to give it, I give it two full points down for that. So I'm back at a five. Now, I, unlike you, Tom, still think the comedy holds up well. And I am giving it a point back up because I think the comedy still holds up well. I think I'm giving it another point back up because even though it's not as culturally relevant as is, you can play the song and people will immediately know what it is. You can put on the uh, pack that they wore in the film and people will know what it is. You ask anybody, name a Bill Murray film. The first film they're going to probably name is either going to be Caddyshack or Ghostbusters. And that, you know, that's a 40-year-old film. So I'm giving it a point back up for that. Well, Bill Murray is like a 70-something-year-old man. Well, yeah. Okay. So ultimately, when I add up everything, I went with a... uh, with an eight for classicness overall, taking into all the accounts of points down for the me too uh, aspect of it, but giving it many points up for the impact it still has the humor that it still possesses and it's overall relevancy in today's world and culture. Again, cultural relevance is legacy, not classic. I understand. But it, it's we've got a lot of category manipulation going on tonight, and it's all from the lawyers. You're a category manipulation. That's what the job of us of the lawyer is. X. Fine. Regardless, it is an eight point five average between the four of us. Rewatchability. I'll go first since I'm going to be the low man on this one. Okay. Then should we let the super fans go? If you so desire. Okay. So on my scale, again, in the Kieran B test, as we like our legal tests on this particular program, putting it on. Honestly, I I don't find myself putting this on. I I can't remember the last time that I had it on or that I just found it on somewhere and, you know, I okay, it's on. So for me, it's kind of in the category of like a two-ish, maybe a 2.5 where I would put it on only if I had to which I kind of did for this film. I know that surprises some, but it's just, it doesn't quite have the same resonance for me as the super fans. 
sorry. It's just, it's not my type of thing. Although there are not many films that I just constantly am going back to on a leaving it on. And again, for those that are from the cord cutter generation of Netflix or whatever else, this is if it's like the first thing in your feed and you get the preview or whatever, and all of a sudden you're watching Ghostbusters again. This is something where if I saw it on cable or whatever else, I might stop and watch a few scenes or something else, but I'm not stopping my day. I'm not planning to necessarily go back to this or something else. So I'd have it in the realm of a three. Thus, I'm at a 5.5. Now, for one of the other people to blow me completely out of the water that obsessively rewatches this movie, go ahead. Just give us your tens and we'll move on. I, I actually don't put this one as a 10 because I'm, out, I'm outside me. I think I talked about would I buy this again if it was in the $5 bin was, was my test for last time. I don't know that, that, that it, it gets that. It does have a lot of nostalgia for me, but for the reasons you were bringing up before, Tom, the, the special effects not holding up, you know, some of, some of the, the creepiness factor of, of Bill Murray makes it a little more cringy as I've gotten it older. I, I rewatch it because, because I love this movie as a kid and because I can still find certain bits of the comedy funny, but I think as a rewatchability for everybody else, I'm at a seven. All right, Keith, you got to have it at a 10, right? I don't for <laughs> the same reasons. I'm going to watch it probably more than anybody else is, but I'm going to be close with, with Adam and, and how, how the movie relates to me. But thinking about you, the sequel had already been out and bombed in theaters by the time you were born, Tom. Correct. So for you to throw it on, you're now passively participating in something that somebody was excited about. The movie was probably at least 10 years old by the time you saw it. The excitement had waned, especially after the sequel had come out. Everybody had moved on. The cartoon wasn't on anymore. They weren't even making the video games anymore. So you were seeing it with, with fresh, unexcited eyes. And you had nobody else's input, really, the first time that, that it got put on for you, whether you did it yourself or somebody else did it for you. And then uh, with... With Dana, him being an adult when it came out, and it was fun and it was exciting, but by the time he went out and got himself a VCR and was uh, buying tapes, Ghostbusters was probably not the movie he was running to the store to buy. So, rewatchability with me, yeah, it's it's a 10 because I rewatch it all the time, but it, you got a valid point that it's not rewatchability for me, it's for everybody else. And like I kind of alluded to earlier, that's it's a small segment of the population in which that's true. So I, I please go with the ten for yourself. This category is very subjective as we normally score it. So you do not have to be objective about how rewatchable it is for me. Okay. Well, since you're insisting on it, I'm going to go ahead and give it a seven. And. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay dad small anecdote all right so i was talking to chris my wife tom's mother about this film and i was going to watch it on monday night and she said well you know monday's kind of are taxing for you are you going to fall asleep i said it won't matter if i do i she says what do you mean i said I haven't seen the movie in probably 15 years. It may have even been longer. And I can tell you every scene, what happens and how it happens. Because I had seen it so many times when I was younger that it is locked into my head. So from a rewatchability point, I had to wrestle with the fact that I don't need to rewatch it because I know the film so well. So, so is that plus for rewatchability or is it negative for rewatchability? Now I can tell you it's funnier the, the less frequently you watch it because the quips and the Bill Murray zingers are much funnier. And the deadpan humor is much funnier because it strikes you. 
you know, and I make this joke and I tell people all the time, I watched Hogan's Heroes from the time I was a little kid up when it was first broadcast through all the reruns after school and such. You could put on an episode of Hogan's Heroes. I could look at it for two seconds and go, oh, this is the episode where LeBeau uh, has to cook a French dinner for Clink in his quarter. I mean, you come into my office, Adam, I know, and Tom, and I've got it on at four o'clock because it's kind of like that's my wind down period where I'm trying to put input stuff, clean up my desk, trying to take care of email stuff. So I could put that on and it is like background noise because I can work for 20 minutes nonstop without focusing. I can look up and immediately get joy out of watching about a minute and a half of Schultz going, I see nothing. And to me, this film is somewhat like that. So actually, I think I am going to give it the highest rating of any of us in this group. I am at a 7.5. So that's a 6.75 average between the four of us. For audience score, we had an 86% for Google users and an 88% for Rotten Tomato users, giving us an 8.7. So to repeat the categories, we had an 8.88 for Legacy, a 9.63 for Impact and Significance, a 9.25 for Novelty, an 8.5 for Classicness, a 6.75 for Rewatchability, and an audience score of 8.7 for a final total of... 51.71. And currently placing it on our list at number 29 in between Goodwill Hunting and Psycho. Okay. I would say that's fair. It's about right. All right. Remaining questions for this one. How do the Ghostbusters survive a giant fireball on the rooftop? They had nowhere to go and no real cover. They were undercover. You could see them coming out of cover at the end of the movie there was there were stone statues and things everywhere and also a ball of ball of fire doesn't doesn't necessarily burn when it flashes you so if you can get behind a little bit of stone you'll be perfectly fine that doesn't explain how they weren't burned while being covered in super hot white sticky that food. is exactly the point i was going to make which is in order to get marshmallow to liquefy it has to be hot and it is burning. How did they not like lose all of their skin from all of that extremely hot, liquefied marshmallow? Next, wouldn't the EPA want a little more information before just turning something off? Even a pollutant, they would have to go through like many different court hearings to decide on whether the government even had the authority to turn it off in the first place. They're not just getting a warrant and shutting it down, especially in the Reagan era. No, in the Reagan era, it might, well, eh, eh. Exercise of executive authority being quick and overreaching in the Reagan era? Yeah. I could see that. That's the executive branch. Yeah. Especially for someone they see as quackpots. Because, I mean, in the context of the film, the, the Ghostbusters are still not broadly accepted. I mean, Dana Dana Barrett's character goes, no mom there for real, while she's talking to him on the phone. So I could see an exercise of authority to just shut it down and make it go away. Although you do have to admit, Nancy Reagan was talking to psychics. But she was also saying, this is your brain on drugs. <laughs> Before we get to some listener questions, do any of you have any remaining questions? Yes, I have one, which is at the end of the film, all of the Ghostbusters are covered in marshmallow, except Bill Murray. Somehow or another, Bill Murray is the one who has almost no marshmallow all over him. I guess so. It's that star star power. It just like it's Teflon. No, if you watch the if you watch the scene where they all break and start running away, Bill Murray is the first one to do it, and when he does it, he actually goes to the stairs. Okay, that's from somebody who's seen the film probably twenty thousand times. 
Yeah. The the one that that always bugs me, and this is going to reference the second movie, is I watched that sequence of events. And in the second movie, they say they d- didn't exist anymore because they got tagged for liability for all the damages for what happened. Except I can't figure out what portion they're tagging for them as actual damages. The Stave Puff Marshmallow is the one that steps on the roof, and there's going to be 50,000 witnesses to that. The building falling apart and the the road damage are acts of God. So what exactly are they tagging them for? What I thought is that they had so many civil suits, and many of them were won, and they couldn't pay, so then the state had to intervene and... Well, right, like, but, you know, but who's what? What are they suing them for? You know, kind of like in the um, in the Sedgwick Hotel when they're just going uh, haywire with the proton packs because that's the only way you can use a proton pack. The the, the how they they started getting famous was because after the Sedgwick Hotel, they got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of calls, and I imagine that in the process of doing those calls, they probably broke a lot of people's shit. And that, that's what I imagine that they got sued for. I don't think it was Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. I think it was, they went over to my mom's house. My mom gave them $5,000, but they literally set the basement on fire. They got to replace the washer and the dryer. And then it takes time to sue people. In my thought process, one, they wrote that in to be tongue-in-cheek about the whole process of trying to get the rights, that they didn't exist because of lawsuits. So that's part of it. But two, I look at it very similarly to the beginning of The Incredibles, the Pixar movie, where Mr. Incredible has to go into hiding because he gets sued for saving someone. Yeah pain and suffering damages potentially derived from people having marshmallow goo, hot marshmallow goo all over them, things of that nature. So it makes you wonder who the real villain is, I guess, in this universe. Was it Gozer? Was it the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man? Was it the APA? It wasn't. It was lawyers. Go back to uh, Shakespeare. First, let's kill all the lawyers. Yeah. All right. A couple of listener questions. First, we have Grant Z from the Best Picture Cast and Worst Picture Cast. Was EPA agent Walter Peck in the right? Sure, forcing the shutdown of the containment unit was a big mistake, but he was concerned about the impact of an unlicensed, quote, high-voltage laser containment system in the middle of the city. How do lasers infect, uh, affect the environment? I don't know how lasers infect the environment. I don't know. But Trump said windmills caused cancer. Regardless. I do think there is a case to be made that the EPA had the right to investigate this. I don't think they had the capacity to just shut things down, but these guys were rather reckless. I mean, they got kicked out of their university for being reckless. They even cited to the fact that they're carrying basically nuclear powered backpacks and they don't know how they work. And this is how the EPA comes in. Where are they storing the discharge from those nuclear power packs? And I actually, I absolutely think this is a valid question. And I honestly think they are in the right because when they asked to see it, just asked, they got told, you go get a court order without provocation. All right. Second listener question is from Kieran B of the Best Picture cast. When you guys think of New York films, what are the first few films that come to mind? Gangs of New York. <laughs> uh, yeah. What's the film? Uh, Sinatra and, and Gene Kelly, New York, New York. I don't know that we one. We watched it together. Taxi Driver's up there for me. I would also say When Harry Met Sally is a iconic New York film for me. Cary Grant, Deborah Kerr film where they meet on top of the... An Affair to Remember? The only part that takes place in New York for that, though, is like the last I, scene. I understand, but it's still so iconic. When Al Pacino slaps the hood of the taxi and says, I'm walking here. What movie you mean is that? Dustin Hoffman in Midnight Cowboy? Yeah, yeah, that one. Here we go. <laughs> okay. I was also raised on musicals, so West Side Story. 
Working Girl. There's a different choice. The sequel to Working Girl, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> okay. All right. Last remaining question for me. Do any of you have any experience with ghosts? I do not. Tangentially? I mean, there's family legends forever that the, the ghost of death visited my, my great grandma's house and pushed past her and that a handprint was burned into her door, which I saw as a kid from that, that experience when my baby great, great uncle was taken from the family. Kidnapped or? No, dead. Unalived. He died that night. Mm. It's family legend. Yeah, that's um, disconcerting. That, that movie made me afraid of ghosts, but if I hadn't have seen that movie, I probably wouldn't have been afraid of ghosts. See, I got unafraid of ghosts because there was somebody who could solve the problem. And there was somebody you knew you could call. Exactly. At 555. <laughs> but I want to thank our guests for being on with us again. Keith, your third time, and Adam, your second. So you're both working towards your hats. few more to go, but I will say thank you to our Scooby-Doo villain for basically booking the rest of the season out uh, at this point. I have not really opened up next season quite yet. So if you want to jump on anything, we've got a lot of stuff planned. A lot of big movies that are available. We're doing the Star Wars trilogy, but there's plenty of big movies available on that list for next season. So you'll have to try and speak for them before they're spoken for by the greater podcasting community that's going to invade our show. But we always enjoy having you both on. It was a pleasure. And just first off, Adam, if anybody wants to find or communicate with you do you have anything online or any place that you'd like to be found uh no not really <laughs> that's kind of what i figured but i give you the opportunity keith what do you got going on yeah i'm, I'm definitely available if you can find the white pages for st croix county <laughs> i'm listed you have uh, a landline <laughs> i don't have a landline but the previous number for this house, the landline that came here, is is still listed. So if you want to find me, that is probably the best way. Okay. So they would have to know the name of the previous owner of your home? No, they can know my name. I'm I'm listed. My address is in the white pages under my name. So if we have a random fan that just shows up at your door, uh, apparently this is how that happens. I'm used to it. I'm I'm used to it. I had to hire somebody. They kind of corral them up, and we come through and do a quick walk or two, or I say hi in the front door, out the back door, and then that's that's it. We got a routine now. I will say this would be this type of thing that one Bill Murray would love to do: is listen to a random podcast about a movie he was in, then listen to the end of this, and then just show up at your door without any prompting. It's true. Well, he does own a baseball team 30 minutes from my house. So if he That's wanted true. to, he's in the neighborhood. My favorite Bill Murray story is, is he was in a restaurant and stole somebody's French fry and said, go ahead and tell people. Nobody will believe you. Yeah, he's been known to uh, walk in the streets of Chicago and just go up to people, put their his hands over their eyes from behind and then say, guess who? And they'll guess. He go, nope, it's Bill Murray. No one's going to believe you. <laughs> So again, thank you to both of you. We enjoyed having you on. We look forward to whenever you're going to be back. Dad, uh, we'll skip remaining thoughts for the week. So that'll do it for us this week. Thank you for listening. Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. Next week for our 215th episode, we welcome new guest Scott Cole of the Movie Friends Pod to discuss a seminal classic of the 1970s for its 50th anniversary. Chinatown from 1974. Written and directed by Roman Polanski with Robert Town. Music by Jerry Goldsmith, starring Jack Nicholson, Faye Dunaway, Burt Young, and John Huston. You won't want to miss that one, so watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. Please like, follow, rate, and review, or whatever on whichever platform you have so that more can join in on our fun. You can also email the show at thenewronnyduncanstudios.com or at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com or find us on YouTube, Instagram, X, Letterboxd, or TikTok at the handle at Podcast. 
The Greatest Movie of All Time is a production of Ronnie Duncan Studios. Our show is mixed, edited, and written by Thomas Duncan. Our music is thanks to Purple Planet Music. Our technical provider and distributor is Captivate FM. 